morning students today lecture of ophthalmology we will learn about the diseases of the eye so everyone knows about the anatomy of the eye and the eyelid its anatomy and its function so now when we learn the diseases of the eyelid the first is the congenital anomalies in that the first is congenital coloboma it is a rare condition is characterized by a full thickness triangular gap in the tissues of the lid so when we can see the diagrammatic representation of the congenital coloboma is that in lid there is the anomaly usually occur near the nasal side and involve upper lid more frequently than the lower lid so it is most frequently seen in the upper lid of the eye and treatment consists of there is a plastic repair of the defect so for this there is a plastic repair is necessary to remove this congenital anomalies that is congenital coloboma and this is a very rare condition but it is characterized by a full thickness of this triangular gap so when we can study the congenital coloboma in this diagram we can see the how there is a full thickness of the triangular gap in the tissues of the lid and the anomaly usually occur near the nasal side so when we can see this diagram in this we can study that how the nasal side of the eyeball shows the congenital anomaly and there is a more involvement of the upper eyelid than the lower eyelid so treatment consists of the plastic repair of the defect then second is the ptosis in the ptosis when we can study about the ptosis it is defined as it is the abnormal grouping of the upper eyelid it's called as a ptosis so when there is a grouping of the upper eyelid abnormally it is called as a ptosis normally upper lid cover about the upper 1/6 of the cornea that is about 2 mm therefore in the ptosis it cover more than 2 mm so when normally upper lid cover the upper 1/6 of the cornea 2 mm and ptosis when there is a ptosis is happen that is abnormal grouping of the upper eyelid then ptosis cover the more than the 2 mm of the space next is the types and etiology of the ptosis so when we study the types and etiology of the ptosis the first one is a congenital ptosis so in a some patient we can see there is a ptosis is occur congenital so this is a, one of the congenital anomalies of the eye it is associated with the congenital weakness that is the mal development of the levator palpebri superioris that is lps and it may occur in the following form so there is a congenital weakness so there is a mal development of the support of the eyelid that is the levator palpebri superioris muscle so due to the weakness of that muscle there is a congenital development of the ptosis that is the abnormal grouping of upper lid so it may occur in the following form that is first one is the simple congenital ptosis simple congenital ptosis is not associated with the any other anomaly second is the congenital ptosis with associated the weakness of the superior rectus muscle so with the weakness of the levator palpebri superioris there is a association with the weakness of the superior rectus muscle so this one happen in the second type of the congenital ptosis third that as a part of the blepharophimosis syndrome which comprises the congenital ptosis that is the blepharophimosis telecanthus and epicanthus irreversible and fourth is the congenital synecdoche ptosis that is the 
Marcus Gorn job winking ptosis. So in the congenital synecdic ptosis, in these conditions, there is a occur a retraction of the totic lid with the jaw movement. That is the with the stimulation of ipsilateral pterygoid muscle. So when there is a stimulation of ipsilateral pterygoid muscle, there is a occurrence of retraction of the lid with the jaw movement, and this leads to the congenital synecdic process. And then there is a blepharophimosis syndrome due to the congenital ptosis and telecanthus and epithelium. So, when we see the diagram of the congenital ptosis, first that this is a, a in that there is a simple congenital ptosis. That is what, what we can see in this diagram. And this is a blepharophimosis syndrome. Set in that case, we can see how there is a congenital ptosis in the blepharophimosis with the telecanthus and the epithelium. So, next is the acquired ptosis. So, acquired ptosis is not a congenitally, is due to the any cause happen, that is the disease or due to the neurogeny, due to myogeny, there are the many causes of the acquired ptosis. So, it, this is also an abnormality or the disease of the eye. So, in the acquired ptosis, it depends upon the cause that it can be a neurogenic, myogenic, hyponeurotic or the mechanical. First one is a neurogenic ptosis and it is caused by the innervation defect such as a third nerve palsy, Horner syndrome, ophthalmo plagic migraine and multiple sclerosis. So, when the neurogenic ptosis is formed, it is due to the intervention defect, like a third nerve palsy. Third nerve palsy, the Horner syndrome, the ophthalmoplegic migraine, multiple sclerosis lead to the neurogenic ptosis, that is the acquired ptosis. And second is a myogenic ptosis. In that case, it occurs due to the acquired disorders of the LPS muscle, that is levator vertebrae superioris muscle, or of the myoneural junction. And it may seen in the patient with the myasthenia gravis, dystrophia myotonica, ocular myopathy, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, and the following trauma to the levator palpebri superioris muscle. So, myogenic ptosis is occur when there is a disorder to LPS or when there is a myoneural junction disorder and it is seen in the patient with the myasthenia gravis. So, in the myasthenia gravis, when there is a dystrophia, mycotonia, ocular myopathy, oculopharyngeal muscle dystrophy due to the trauma, of the LPS muscle, that is levator palpebris superioris muscle, shows the disorder which lead to the myogenic ptosis, that is the type of the acquired ptosis. Third one is the aponeurotic ptosis. It develops due to the defect of the levator appendix in the presence of the normal functioning muscle. So, the function of the muscle is normal, but there is a defect in the Levator aponeurosis, so which lead to the aponeurotic ptosis. It includes the involution, that is the senile ptosis, and post-operative ptosis, which is rarely observed after the cataract and the retinal detachment surgery. Ptosis due to the aponeurotic weakness associated with the blepharoclamysis and in the traumatic dehiscences or disinsertion of the aponeurotic. So when aponeurotic ptosis is happen, then there is a defect in the levator aponeurosis in the presence of the normal functioning muscle. And it includes the senile postoperative ptosis and the ptosis due to the aponeurotic weakness associated with 
black furrow, thromosis, and traumatic dehiscence, and this is insertion of the aponeurosis. So this is the cause of aponeurotic ptosis. Fourth one is the mechanical ptosis. Mechanical ptosis it may result due to the excessive weight on the upper lid, as seen in the patient with the lid tumor. When there is a multiple chalazion and the lid edema. So when there is a excessive weight on the upper lid, in the case of the lid tumor, multiple chalazion, lid edema, then this results in the mechanical process. It may also occur due to the scarring of the cicatrial process as seen in the patient with the ocular phlegmoid trichoma. So it may occur due to the scarring as seen in the patient with the ocular phlegmoid and trichoma and the uh, treatment of this ptosis is the surgery. Surgery is the only treatment of the Then third one is the EP cancer. So EP cancer it is a semicircular fold of the skin which cover the medial canthus. It is the semi semicircular fold of the skin which cover the medial canthus. Then it is a bilateral condition and may disappear with the development of the limb. So may, it may be a bilateral see, and it may disappear with development of the nose. It is a normal facial feature in the Mongolian races and it is the most common congenital anomaly of the lid. So epicanthus is more commonly seen congenital anomaly of the lid and treatment is that, that it consists of plastic repair of the deformity. So it also needs a surgery that is the plastic repair of the deformity. Fourth one is this deciduous. The congenital deciduous is a rare anomaly in which an extra row of the cilia occupies the position of the meibomian gland, which open into their follicle as an ordinary sebaceous gland, and these cilia are usually directed backward and when rubbing the cornea and it should be electroepilated or creoepilated. So, congenital deciduous is a rare anomaly in which an extra row of the cilia, when there is an extra row of the cilia occupies the position of the meibomian gland. So, it occupies the position of meibomian gland and which open into their follicle. So, they open into the follicle as an ordinary sebaceous gland. And the cilia are usually directed backward when rubbing the cornea and should be electroepilated or cryoepilated. So, in that, there is an acquired deciduous that is the metaplastic lashes. It occurs when, due to the metaplasia and differentiation, the meibomian gland are transferred, transformed into the hair follicle. And the most important cause is that the late stage of the cicatrice. It is associated with the chemical injury, Steven Johnson syndrome, and ocular cicatrial cancer. So, in the metaplastic lasis, it is occurred due to the metaplasia and differentiation of the meibomian gland are transferred into the hair. Then, fifth one is cryptophthalmos. So, this is a diagrammatic presentation of cryptophthalmos. In that, we can see that it is a rare anomaly in which a lid fails to develop and the skin passes continuously from the eyeball to the cheek hiding the eye. 
So this is a very rare condition. But when it happens, it shows the milk failed to develop and the skin passes continuously from the eyeball to the cheek, hiding the Next one is the inflammatory disorders of the eyelid. So, in the diseases of the eyelid, there are types like the congenital abnormalities. That's what we can learn. And next is the inflammatory disorders of the eyelid. So, first one is the blepharitis. So, blepharitis is defined as a it is a subacute or the chronic inflammation of the eyelid margin. That is the meeting place of the skin and conjunctiva. So when there is a meeting place of the skin and conjunctiva, that is the eyelid margin shows the subacute or the chronic inflammation. It leads to the blepharitis or it is called as the blepharitis. Then next is the etiology in that there is a predisposing factor like age. So it is usually in the children. But maybe it is seen in the any age group. Usually bilaterally seen external irritation like a dust, wind, smoke, cosmetics also lead to the blepharitis. Then when there is an unhygienic condition and eyes are strained due to the error of reflection. So when there are these causes are seen, this lead to the blepharitis. Next is the constitutional, that is the nature of the skin. When there is a seborrhea, the seborrhea lead to the blepharitis. And when metabolic cause like excessive carbohydrate diet and toxic factor, like when there is a septic focus, allergic factor like eczema of the skin and inflammation of the neighboring structure like the conjunctivitis, dacryocystitis, that is to summarize a dirt and staphylococcal infection in the children with the seborrhea in the adult and adolescent age with the allergy in the adult's life. These all lead to the blepharitis. So these are the most predisposing and etiological factor of the blepharitis. So next is the clinical type. In that, first one is the squamous, that is not infected. Metabolic hygienic factors and seborrhea of the skin. The symptoms are that there is a no pain, discomfort may be present, untreated epiphora due to the anatomic changes in the movement. So when there is a no pain, discomfort may be present and epiphora due to the anatomic changes in the lid margin. So this is the diagram of the seboric blepharitis. In that we can see how there is a subacute and the chronic inflammation of the lid margin due to the seboria. This is a seboric blepharitis. Seboric blepharitis. Signs. White scale, like a dandruff like or lead margin. On removing the scale, there is a hyperemic but no inflammation. And falling of the eyelashes, they are quickly replaced with the thick lead margin. So when there are the white scale, like a dandruff on the lid margin, on removing the scale that is hyperemic but no ulceration, falling of eyelashes, they are quickly replaced in the thick lid margin. Second is the ulcerative blepharitis. Due to the infection like a staphylococcal, separating inflammation of the ciliary follicle is occur. The symptoms are there is a soreness of the lid margin. Lacrimation, itching, photophobia. With the signs are that there is a yellow crust at the root of the eyelashes. Eyelashes are glued together. On removing the crust, there is a small ulcer appear around the base of the eyelashes, which bleeds freely. And the falling of the eyelashes, which are either not replaced or when replaced, it is a means. So when 
we see the symptom that there is a soreness of the leg muscle with the lacrimation itching and photophobia and when we can see the signs of the papyritis in that we can see there is a yellow crust at the root of the eyelash that what we see in that there is a yellow crust hmm, in the root of eyelash then eyelashes are glued together so in that we can see how the eyelashes are glued together on removing the crust there is a small ulcer appear around the base of it and when we remove the crust there is a formation of ulcer which is here at the base of eyelash and falling of the eyelash which are either not replaced or when replaced it is not then next one is the ulcerative blepharitis so when we can see the diagram of the ulcerative blepharitis you can see how there is a subacute or the chronic inflammation of the lid margin as there is a formation of the small ulcer around the lid if not treated in the time due to the infection and suppurative inflammation of ciliary follicle there is a soreness of lid margin and lacrimation itching so how we can see there is a lacrimation the patient feel that there is itching there is a photophobia so these are the signs of he not treated in time that is a madrosis that is the scan to eyelash psychosis so when the blepharitis is not treated it lead to the scan to eyelash that is the madrosis and trichosis tylorism that is the hypertrophy of the lid margin due to the development of secretorial tissue due to the drooping of the lid then there is a ectropion that is eversion of lid margin and it causes a constant epithelium so these are the complication of the blepharitis that is madrosis trichosis tylosis and ectropion so how these are formed when blepharitis is not treated on time so next one is the posterior blepharitis that is the mebomitis Chronic mebomitis is a mebomian gland dysfunction and seen more commonly in the middle aged person with the acne rosea and seborrheic dermatitis. It is characterized by a white frothy foam like secretion on the eyelid margin and can have that is the mebomian seborrhea. And on eversion of the eyelid, there is a vertical yellowish streak. shining through the conjunctiva are seen and at the lid margin there is a opening of mebomian gland become prominent with the thick secretion so when we can see a diagram of the posterior blepharitis that is mebomitis in that we can see there is a mebomian gland dysfunction and seen more commonly in the middle age person with the acne rosea and seborrheic dermatitis and in this we can see there is a white and frothy that is the foam like secretion on the eyelid margin this is a foam like white secretion on the eyelid margin and cancer that is the mebomian seborrhea and on the eversion of the eyelid there is a vertical yellowish streak shining through the conjunctiva are seen and at the lid margin there is a opening of the mebomian gland and become prominent with the thick secretion so next is the parasitic blepharitis so blepharitis africa refer to a chronic blepharitis associated with the demodex follicularum infection and thysis palpebrum to that due to the crab lungs that is very rarely to the head lung in addition to the feature of the chronic blepharitis it is characterized by the presence of nit at the lid margin and at the root of the eyelash so it is present of the nit at the lid margin so at the lid margin there is a presence of the nit 
and at the root of the arteries. So next is the there is a treatment. So when it consists of the mechanical removal of the need with the forceps which is followed by the rubbing of antibiotic ointment on the mid margin and the lodging of the patient other family member there is a clothing and bedding. So when we can see the treatment of parasitic blepharitis in that removal of the mechanically, removal of meat with the forceps which is followed by antibiotic ointment on the mid margin and delivering the patient with the family member clothing and bedding. This is most important treatment in the parasitic case. So this is the thiasis palpebra. So how in that we can see how there is an inflammation of the mid margin. The leaves are aggregated together. There is a sudoric Nephritis also seen in such cases with the sepulia. So treatment of blepharitis both the types that is the general treatment and local treatment. So firstly in the general treatment we can see improving the general health in the children. So general health improve is the most important in the children. We, and also with that, there is a balanced diet with the vitamin. Mostly the vitamin A is necessary for me. There is a removal of the septic focus that is the tonsillitis and correction of the error of refraction with the treatment of the seborrhea of the scalp and treatment of the chronic conjunctivitis that is the chronic vacuosis. So, when we see the treatment of the blepharitis generally improving the health is most important with the balanced diet and vitamin that is vitamin A is most necessary and removing of the septic focus with the correction to the error of refraction and treatment to the seborrhea of the scalp, chronic conjunctivitis, chronic necrosis is most important when treating the blepharitis generally. And locally, removal of the scale and the crust with the 3% soda bite. With the antibiotic ointment like gentamicin, chloromycetin, steroid, that is the split antimere. And after healing of the ulcer, there is a hydrocortisone ointment 1% TID for the congestion and And treatment of the trichisis entropian is the most important in, in the propensity of the blood. Next one is the external cordial, that is the spa. Spa is the most important topic of diseases of the eyelid. It is important in the clinical practice, in theory, in viva, in all the things. So, when we can study a sty, it is defined as a circulative inflammation of the follicle of the eyelid, including the gland of the ears. So, Star is a suppurative inflammation of follicle of eyes, including the gland of the ears. Then, so these are the definition of the star, which is most important. Etiology is that it occur at the any age, but common in the young. And metabolic causes are that when there is a diabetes, debility, and excess carbohydrate diet intake, causative agent like the coagulase positive cephalococcus. So these are the causes of the star. And symptoms are that when there is an acute pain in the mid margin. With the sense of heaviness and 
So there is an acute and very severe pain in the lower margin with the sense of heaviness and pain. So when there is a suppurative inflammation, there is a also heat is present in this inflammation with the heaviness feeling over the eyelid. And signs that what we seen in the patient while examining that that is the swelling, then rending, edema of the affected limb. Then there is the tenderness at the point of inflammation with the white first point becomes visible on the lid margin with the enlarged preauricular lid. So where there is a swelling, redness and edema of the affected lid and tenderness at the point of inflammation. When there is a white first point become visible on lid margin with the enlarged preauricular lymphoma. And there is a force is that the first point burst outside and pain and swelling subsides. So when there is a first point it burst, so pain and swelling is subsides. This is a general thing. Then treatment of sky is that there is a hot compression. We can do with the gentamicin eye drop, QID that is the 4 times in a day, and Ficillin to 50 mg QID orally for 5 days. With the first should be drained by pulling out the affected eyelash or by small incision. So these are the treatments. So for the sky we can use hot compression, gentamicin eye drop, and Ficillin to 50 QID with QID eye drop. And lastly, when there is a purse, it should be drained by pulling eye affected eyelash or by a small incision we can drain the purse. Next one is Hodilum externum, that is the start of the upper eyelid. So this is a diagram of the upper eyelid scar. So in that diagram we can see how there is a swelling, redness, inflammation, heaviness, heat. That patients suffer of the scar. So when we can see a difference in the scar and the chalodion, this is a very important diagram that how the scar occur in the lead margin. And chalodion is occur just above the lead margin. So this is a suppurative inflammation of the follicle of the eyelashes. So this is a sty when this include the gland of the eye and when there is a inflammation of the eyelashes. So this is a sty and this one is the chalazion. So chalazion is a chronic inflammatory of the granuloma of the mebomian. So chalazion is the inflammation of the mebomian gland the star is the inflammation of the eye. So this is a diagrammatic differentiation of the star and the chalice. Chalazion which is also called as a tarsal cyst, mebomian cyst and it is defined as the chronic inflammatory granuloma of the mebomian gland. So pathologically, when we see the, how the chalazion is occurred, so when there is a low grade infection due to the staphylococcus through the duct of the mebomian gland, there is an infiltration of the wall of the duct with the leukocytes and there is a proliferation of epithelium of the eye and duct get blocked. So there is a mebomian secretion of the millet gland enlarged. Secretion is a fatty and it acts like the irritant. Then there is an inflammation and granuloma formation. And more than one gland may be affected as it commonly seen in the young. So chalodion is also an important topic in the diseases of the eyelid. When there is a low grade infection due to the staphylococcus through the duct of the mebomian gland. 
and infiltration of the wall of the duct with the leukocyte and there is the proliferation of epithelium of the duct. So, the mebomian gland duct is a good and mebomian secretion accumulate. Duct blocks, so secretion is accumulated and gland is enlarged. So, there is a secretion in the fatty and it acts like an irritant. So, there is a very irritation, inflammation and granular formation. So, more than one gland is affected in these cases and it is commonly seen in the gland. So, the course of the chalazion is that there is a small and may undergo resolution, may remain as it is. Maybe there is a small course or it may remain as it is or may burst on the skin or the conjunctiva and the granuloma may protrude through the duct on the lid margin. Then there is a secondary infection like internal hernia. Treatment for these cases is that antibiotic we can use in such a cases with the bigger inside vertically through the tarsus conjunctiva that is by the local anesthesia we can take collagen and with the antibiotics. So in that there is how we can see there is a chalazion of the upper eyelid that is the inflammation of the medium. Fourth one is the internal hernia. So when there is a suppurative inflammation of the mebomian gland associated with the blockage of the duct, then it is called as the internal hernia. Etiology is that it may occur as a primary staphylococcal infection of the mebomian gland or due to the secondary infection in a chalazion, that is infected chalazion. So when there is a secondary infection to the chalazion or there is a staphylococcal infection of the mebomian gland, it leads to the internal hernia. Clinically, symptoms are similar to the hordeolum externum, that is the style, except that the pain is more intense due to the swelling being embedded deeply in the dense fibrous tissue. So, as comparing to the chalazion, there is a more intense pain in extern internal hordeolum as it is failing is being embedded deeply in the dense fibrous tissue. So this is a hordeolum internum of the lower eye. So it is the more painful. On examination, it can be differentiated from the hordeolum externum by the fact that it is the point of maximum tenderness and swelling is away from the lid margin and that the pus usually point on the tarsal conjunctiva. That is as seen as the yellowish area on the everting the lid and not on the root of the cilia sometimes. First point may be seen at the opening of the Involved mebomian gland and are rarely on the skin. So, when we can examine uh, this uh, differentiation, the hordeolum externum, by the fact that there is a point of the maximum tenderness and swelling is away from the lid much, that the pus usually point on the tarsal conjunctiva. So treatment, which is similar to the 